Hey, Kev, let's let's follow this trail over here. This looks like there might be something waiting down there. All right. Hey, wait a minute. Do you hear that? Yeah, I thought it was just me. What the heck is that? I don't know what that is. Whoa, do you smell that, too? That's unbelievable. Hey, look. What the? Hey, look, those, those branches are moving over there. What the heck is that? Holy cow, is that what I think it is? Look at that thing. It, oh my god. It's a freaking Sasquatch. Welcome to the Bigfoot Terror in the Woods Sightings and Encounters podcast. My name is W.J. Sheehan author of the series of books entitled Bigfoot Terror in the Woods, Sightings and Encounters, all of which are available at Amazon, iTunes, and Audible, volumes one through nine, available in both formats. So please partake of that. And folks, volume 10 is wrapped. I have it out to my book lady, And hopefully sooner than later, I will have that launched and I can begin recording that on Audible as well. So we can look forward to that. And now, without any further ado, may I introduce you to my blood brother and co-host, KJ Sheehan. Kev, how are you? I'm doing all right, Bill. I'm pretty jealous that you have a book, lady. (laughs) <laughs> you gotta have a little help in this life oh no doubt about that yeah i am uh i am back from spain now from barcelona uh-huh. and uh, madrid so uh as you could tell my voice is not doing any better than when i came back from south america a couple of weeks ago so <laughs> it has to do with speaking all of that espanol <laughs> <laughs> and what happens with these trips that you lose your voice uh, it's a long haul, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it's you were a miracle. Scre- I could still stand up. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I thought you might be screaming at people. No, no. It's it's just rough, you know. I mean, Spain for folks out there that haven't been to Spain. I love it. It's beautiful. The people are wonderful. But you know, I was there working, so our work days would start very early in the morning. And then in Spain, you really don't go after dinner until about nine o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. And so then you're back at like midnight, you do some email, you look at some cryptids in the news, and then you still got to get up at six. You know, you do that for five or six days in a row and you're like, all right, I'm done. (laughs) What? Wait a minute. You need more than three or four hours sleep? What? What? I don't know. I know. I know. (laughs) I know. I'm a rookie there, as one of my buddies would say, <laughs> sleeping is cheating. Yeah, sleeping is <laughs> optional. Exactly. It's cheating. <laughs> so, but it was good. It was good. It was it was cold though. You know, in Spain, uh this time of the year it's very seasonal. So uh at night it was below freezing. So yeah. you know. Yeah. Even a little colder than normal. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, Paula used to tell me that Spain was a lot like the Northeast up here in America, you know, on that same uh, equatorial line, whatever you want to call it, you know, we're yeah. kind of in a similar pattern seasonally as they are, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely a little chilly, and uh, but beautiful. And again, the folks are great. The food is great. You know, the Spanish tapas, we have all these small plates of croquettes and jamon, you know, where they bring out the aged pig leg bill. Love it. Oh, my God. And they're slicing a little bit of pig hoof and pig leg <laughs> off. <laughs> you just can't beat that with a stick. It's fantastic. Now, listen, if you were a dog, you'd want to gnaw on that little hoof a little bit. You know, I tried to give a little gnaw on it, but they pushed me away. <laughs> <laughs> they said, we don't do it that way. I was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe that's why I'm hoarse from eating all the hamon. And growling. Well, that too. 
<laughs> oh, my goodness. So what do we have tonight, bro, in our cryptids in the news and other oddities segment? Yeah, we got some weird stuff going on this week. You know, we've had a lot of weird stuff lately. You know, uh-huh. don't get me wrong, but... This week, um, you, I think you saw the article, Bill. I know one of our listeners wrote in about it as well. The Mexican president claimed he has a photo of the mythical woodland elf. Yeah, that's a pretty strange-looking photograph of that thing sitting up in the crotch of that tree. I know. Well, by the way, the tree is pretty weird looking, too. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, does that tree have a face or is it just me? You know. So, uh, yeah, pretty wild. You know, and he's got about five million followers as of of that particular tweet, as of the recording of this podcast. And, um, you know, a lot of folks thought that he was joking around, but it seems like he's not joking around at all. Yeah, it, it, and first of all, again, let's fall back to the fact that if you're in a position like that, uh, I don't know if you just come out and make yourself to be a fool. Uh, uh, why he would even do it to begin with is a little strange to me, but he did. And uh, what do you make of it? Well, I mean, hats off to him. Like, maybe he has a history of seeing these things throughout his life, and then... When he sees a photo of one, and these guys were building, the the guys and gals that photographed it were building a railroad that will connect tourists to the the Mayan ruins. Mm -hmm. So they were out in the middle of nowhere, and they had this photograph. They shared it with him, and then he posted it on Twitter. Wait a minute. They're building a rail line to connect to the Mayan ruins? Yeah, well, from uh, on the Yucatan Peninsula, they're yeah. building a railway um, that is, is constructed to transport tourists to and from popular destinations, including the Mayan ruins. Wow, that is an um, ambitious project. Well, yeah, but, you know, and that's this creature, you know, the uh, they say that... They may be getting back at people who are invading from other lands and, you know, kind of taking away their territory. We've heard that before, right? Yeah, well, you know, and I also, I haven't said this in a while, but, you know, uh, Paula and I would uh, occasionally watch Spanish television together. And uh, the even on the news broadcast, the mainstream news broadcasts, uh, they would regularly, if they had anything to talk about or show you via film footage, they would regularly post and show on the news uh, UFOs, flying brujas or witches, uh, all kinds of ghosts, things caught on cameras by houses and street cams. Uh, they were not uh, afraid at all. Yeah, they weren't shy about the uh, mythological and the cryptids, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember you talking about that for sure. Yeah, very... Uh, yes. So so this elf, by the way, this woodland elf, is part of Mayan folklore, and it's generally referred to as an alux, which is A-L-U-X. Mm-hmm. And they're kind of like uh, small... Mischievous creatures that inhabit forests and fields mm-hmm. and are prone to playing tricks on people, mm-hmm. like hiding things, etc. And mm-hmm. some people leave uh, offerings, small offerings, to appease the alux so that the alux don't pick on them. Mm. Well, I'd like to appease them with a 12-gauge shell. <laughs> Bang! Bang! <laughs> that too, but you don't know. Maybe they're packing as well. <laughs> oh, my God. So get this. You know, they say that they're about knee high, so they're pretty small. Mm-hmm. And they often resemble or look like miniature, traditionally dressed Mayan people. It did look like it had some type of garments some on, didn't it? Some type of hood on in the picture. Yeah. And folks, I'll put the photo up on BigfootTerrorInTheWoods.com under episodes and this particular episode, which is 189. Yeah. Really interesting. So this 
photograph was taken by some of the workers building the... An engineer. An engineer working on this railroad. Unbelievable. And he somehow, I guess it got around and eventually got back to the president. Yeah, and he posted it. And folks, this picture, let me talk about the picture a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you see a tree trunk. It's black and white. Uh, you know, taken at night, and it's a tree trunk kind of curving to the left. I would estimate it. I have no scale to estimate it to, but just to try to paint the picture for you of maybe an eight-inch tree trunk. And this creature is on the right-hand side as you look at it as a tree trunk with, like, its left appendage around the left-hand side of the trunk and then its right hand side, or right hand around the back side of the trunk, and then it's looking directly at the photographer with a blackish face, dark gray face, two eyes lit up white, and then like a bit of a white uh, image around the top of its brow, and then some type of a hood on. Yeah. Of sorts, for sure. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, you don't, folks, you don't have to use your imagination. To say this is something like with the face of a human. Yeah, yeah. You know, in this business of cryptids, people send me stuff sometimes, and I'm like, I don't know about that. I I see uh, nothing. You yeah. Know? This one, black and white, no pun intended, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's, right it's not it's not like the old face in the eggs thing. It, no. It, it no. looks, if, it, if it's real, it's real. Pardon no, and pun, somebody you know? on Twitter said it's a raccoon. I'm like, hey, I got raccoons out in my backyard right now. Yeah. That ain't no raccoon. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't no bear. <laughs> <laughs> I know what raccoons look like. That ain't a raccoon. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you know, and I was just saying this to somebody, I think, yesterday. Uh, you don't look at an eagle flying over your house and say, hey, look at the seagull. Right. I mean, we're all capable of an instantaneous identification response using our brain, our mind, uh, to identify a cat versus a, a lion. Our brains, or, you know, the combination of our vis vision, hearing, you know, that when you put them together with the power of our brain, amazingly powerful. Yeah. Even in compromised situations, you know, like low light. Highlight, underwater, whatever you want to say. Like, we're really good at figuring out which one of these things does not belong. <laughs> right. Yeah, there's no doubt like about the it. childhood game. You know, another thing I thought was interesting, I don't know if you picked up on the fact that the, uh, the uh, dwarf or elf had an emblazoned uh, NY on his hood. So he's a Giants fan. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't show up in the story. I'll have to take, oh, another, look take another, another look. Take another look. Did he have one on his shoulder too, like a little sleeve <laughs> patch? And it was clearly a giant, not a Yankee fan. That's right. <laughs> I mean, baseball's coming up here. Yeah, no, I'm so glad that we're going to be into a legit, legit season, you know. And uh, so next weekend, by the way, folks, we flip our clocks. Forward oh, an hour. I didn't even know that. Yeah. You know, of course, I always do that Saturday night when I get home. And yeah, uh, well, yeah. The days are days are already getting a little longer. We got a church tonight. And usually when we go into church, we go on Sunday night. It's kind of a weird time, but it works for us. And uh, usually when we go in, the sun has set mm -hmm. this time of the year. And when we came out tonight, the sun was setting. Yeah. So it was no, like a full hour off. Oh, God, thank uh, you. You know, again, not in one week, but enough that I noticed it this week. You know. Yeah, no, it's a great time of year, and, uh, you know, just it's good for everybody, good for our spirits. We all need a freaking uh, lift. Sun is good. Yeah, sun so good. that that elf picture, man, and you're going to post that to uh, uh along with this episode 189, and folks, yeah, take yeah, a yeah. look at that. Yeah, so get this, Bill. There's a couple yeah. more points here. Yeah. So about about the looks. So some Maya believe that uh, they are called into being when a farmer builds a little house on his proper, property, most often in a cornfield. And for seven years, the looks will help the corn grow, 
summon the rain and patrol the fields at night. So a little bit like a, a scarecrow that's alive. <laughs> <laughs> and he's looking to scare everybody, not well, just get crows. This. Here's where we get to scaring everyone. Uh-huh. At the end of the seven years, uh-huh. the farmer must close the windows and doors of the little house, sealing the looks inside. If this is not done, the looks will run wild and start playing tricks on people. <laughs> so what kind of tricks do you think they play? Uh, stealing the dog's toys. <laughs> <laughs> so legend has it that they will occasionally stop and ask farmers or travelers for an offering. If they refuse, the Lux will wreak havoc, havoc <laughs> and spread illness. However, if the conditions are met, if it is, it is thought that the Lux will protect the person from thieves or even bring them good luck. Oh, that's nice. Yes, so it's a, a little bit like a black-eyed children. Yeah. <laughs> Can I borrow your what? phone? <laughs> if you let me inside, I just want to borrow your phone. Yeah. Now, I don't really know that Black Eyed Children will bring you good luck or you will ever speak to anyone again after you let them inside. <laughs> <laughs> One more reason to end it with a shotgun blast when you first see it. <laughs> don't take any chances with an Alux, folks. No. <laughs> So Boy, pretty that's cool, crazy. Pretty cool, though, right? Now, is there any is there any real history? There must be some history to this uh, that he's taken to post it and uh, has a belief in this nasty. Well, little this bugger. all this stuff I talked about, you know, you can find it on the internet. Not related to this story, mm-hmm. and um, you know, so they've been around forever, going back to Mayan culture, and mm-hmm. um, people believe that they exist. Like an imp or, you know, fairy in the forest. Like in Europe, you have the fairies. Mm-hmm. Um, and this thing is a mischievous imp known as an alux. Wow. So it's but pretty I, wild. Like, I thought it was pretty cool. And the picture, you know, makes it super cool. Yeah, you know, Kev, and, but I guarantee you, here we are again in this day and age where we're talking about the availability of cameras uh, vis-a-vis uh, cell phones with cameras on them, which no sure. doubt this was taken by. And you're still going to have people uh, doubting uh, the veracity of what they're seeing. Now, whether or not you believe in this or, or anything at all, that's not what I'm addressing. I'm addressing people that just will not believe that this photograph was taken. No doubt about it. But, Bill, you know, again, folks, you look at it when I post it. It is a pretty cool photograph. Yeah, there's no doubt that it's this a cool photograph. This is not photograph. something where you're looking at it. Again, like so many of the things I look at is like a dark patch between, you know, leaves on a branch that's 50 yards away. This right. isn't that. Right, and somebody's telling you it's a Bigfoot. Right, exactly. I mean, and and I'm not picking on people for seeing that. If that's what you see, it's okay. Right. It's just hard for me to follow when I'm not there and I'm looking at a still photograph. But when I look at this, it's not a tree and it's not a raccoon. I don't yeah. know what it is, but, you know. Kev, you recall all of the uh, Dyatlov pictures that were downloaded oh, yeah. off of that 35-millimeter oh, yeah. camera? Yeah. Where I said that there were a lot of pictures of the pine trees that they were skiing or walking in front of. Yep. And my opinion was that somebody saw something or heard something in there and was trying to ratchet off some shots here and there, hoping to catch something. But exactly, because you happen. and I looked. Yeah, you and I looked at it and said, "Why are these people with a film camera? We only have, you know, what." 26 pictures or whatever they used to have. 35 millimeter wind up film camera. Why are you taking so many pictures of a tree? Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. That's a good point. Yeah, and my opinion in that case was that they were trying to catch something but failed and then finally caught that one shot of it. Yep. Uh crossing that little lane in the trees. Yeah, 100%. Uh, so uh anyways, not to change the subject, but 
the camera stuff is always a bugaboo, you know. Oh yeah. But I don't ha- I don't have a problem of it with it, whether it's in a lux or something else entirely. Uh, it seems to me like uh, whoever took that picture got a good shot of what it is. I mean, it's pretty damn cool to me. Yeah, man, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. Wow. Well, good job with that, bro. <laughs> Very interesting, the Lux. And uh, I have an account here that I think you're really going to uh, be amazed by. It was told to me by a fellow named Lewis Radcliffe a resident of Westchester County, Kev, right outside of New York. Uh, And this is what Lewis had to say. This story that I'm about to share with you came to me in a most unusual way via my own grandfather and uncle when I was a young boy. My father and his brother, Pete, both grew up on a simple farm in western Pennsylvania. My grandpa, Max, had a working dairy farm and was involved in the making of cheese, butter, and milk, which he supplied to local customers. I don't recall specifically when, but sometime in the 70s, we were gathered around the TV. A show came on the tube that was hosted by the guy who played Spock on Star Trek. Kev, who was that? Leonard Nimoy. Leonard Nimoy. That was in search of. That's right. Super I, cool show. Yeah. So he's he's recalling this as a kid. I don't remember his name, but the show was about Bigfoot, and we were turned in, uh, we were tuned in in our living room. Now, as a little boy, I was basically sitting on the sofa listening to the adults, with them occasionally goofing around with me. My dad and uncle started talking about the creature on the TV being the same thing that they had seen back on the farm when they were younger in Pennsylvania. I distinctly remember my asking them about what they saw being more than a little frightened at the time at what I was seeing on the television. My father and uncle began to speak simultaneously, talking over each other, adding to and talking about the events that I will now attempt to put in some order for you and your readers. Apparently, at the time, many different farmers in the area had been experiencing losses of their farm animals, with the losses being in no way relative to a certain species of animal. The farmers who regularly met and spoke with each other were reporting losses of everything from a chicken to their farm dogs. This had apparently been going on for some time when one of the farmers, a Mr. Miller, had reported seeing a large black gorilla-type beast moving on all fours along his fence line at twilight. He stated that its back was level with the rails on his four-foot fence along the property, making this what he thought to be the biggest black bear he had ever seen. This went on, They went on to say that Mr. Miller, after sighting this purported black bear, saw the same creature on his property some two weeks later, only this time, as he watched what he had previously thought was a bear, it stood up on its hind legs, stepped over the rails of the fence, and walked into the woods. After Mr. Miller had reported his sighting of this creature, all of the farmers were on watch, including my grandpa Max. They were already having discussions about how to deal with it. The creature was undoubtedly the villain behind the missing animals. The animals were being taken over a variety of farms covering a large area of the countryside. Mr. Miller's farm was about five miles from my grandpa's. If it was in fact this one beast doing all the dirty work, it had to be covering a tremendous amount of territory to do so. Several weeks later, my dad and uncle were loading hay into the loft. 
my uncle was in the high position with the opening of the hayloft, within the opening of the hayloft, while my dad was hoisting bales up to him. From my uncle's position in the loft, he had a great view looking out over the farm, which my dad did not, being on the ground near the truck. My dad said that Uncle Pete shouted and pointed, saying, That beast is out in the far end of the pasture, walking along the woods. My dad said they jumped into the truck and began to try and make their way in the direction of the siding. As they rolled over a rise in the pasture, they saw the beast walk into the trees and out of sight. Following the events of that day, with there now being confirmation of what Mr. Miller had seen weeks earlier, some five miles away, the farmers had another meeting. They had proposed the idea of forming a posse. By their own organizational efforts, the posse would regularly work areas near to the adjoining properties on foot, horseback, or by whatever means they deemed fit to hunt down this beast and put an end to the carnage. In the weeks and months that followed this initial meeting, a number of the posse who were surveilling the farms all hours of the day had seen the beast. Some of the farmers were describing it differently than others, which was leading the men to believe that there was was actually more than one creature afoot in the area. At the same time, more animals were still being taken, with others noticing other things awry around their farms, including barn doors opened and fence rails knocked down in fields where no animals were present. My dad and uncle said that after a period of many months, a group of men in a pickup truck came upon the creature in a field. After giving chase in the truck, a man riding shotgun hit the beast with two rounds out of the truck's window, which knocked it to the ground. As they stopped the truck, the beast jumped to its feet and ran across the field into the timber. Several weeks after that shooting, another group of men had run upon a creature on the farm of one Mr. Slazinger. They also fired some slugs at it as it ran from an animal pen. Neither of these two shootings had yielded a dead body. But according to my dad and uncle, the missing animals and other related activities had ceased. Although the men kept up with their patrols for quite some time afterward. They said that when they had seen this creature... In Grandpa's field, it was very tall and muscular, even from a distance. It had long arms and took very long strides as it lumbered along. Mr. Miller, who had seen it step over the fence, commented on how neither a bear nor a man could have done such a thing. None of this information may ever have been known by me had it not been for the television show That Day in the House. What do you think of that, Kev? Wow, now where was this bill? In like downstate New York? No, Pennsylvania. Oh, Pennsylvania. For some reason I thought New York. (coughs) Well, uh, the fellow that reported the Lewis Radcliffe was from Westchester. Oh, that's what confused me. That's that's right. why I was saying uh, but, downstate New York. Yeah, he was recalling his childhood on his grandfather Max's farm in uh, Pennsylvania. Cool. So that was, uh, I mean, really an interesting account of ongoing witness sighting, uh, missing animals over a period of many months, uh, guys out literally hunting this thing, I guess in their spare time or as they were able. Uh, guys getting shots off from a pickup truck window. 
uh, walking, hiking, horseback riding, whatever. They were surveilling uh, a large swath of property, uh, trying to find the culprit for, uh, you know, and many people today uh, are too easy on what people are willing to do with, like, varmint control. And, you know, I was talking to somebody not too long ago about just uh, woodchucks. You know, these buggers dig these holes out in these fields. And you can have a prize piece of cattle or a horse or something step in one of those holes, break its leg and have to be put down. So farmers and cattle ranchers and other people of that ilk uh, have no mercy no, well, I mean, they have mercy, but they're not bringing an animal. They're not bringing a chicken to the vet to be euthanized. That's right. Yeah. They, you know, they get it in a way that somebody in suburbia does not. No, they live with it every day, you know. I mean, it's just different perspective. But yeah, Bill, it is. That's wild because it sounds like it was a ape-like critter, you know. The way they first described it. Yeah. And, and then what, it's standing up, you know. Yeah. What is a critter like that doing in Pennsylvania, you know? No. Well, I was going to say, if it was Westchester, maybe it got out of the Bronx Zoo. Yeah. Or a circus train <laughs> derailed in uh, Pennsylvania and it escaped. You know, Amtrak comes up that way. And, you know, Amtrak's not that reliable, so it could be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, he jumped a turnstile. And yeah, uh, like, ran into Mr. Miller's farm. I mean, the first time you see him, Mr. Miller, you got to ask him, do you actually have a ticket? Did you pay for this ride? <laughs> another, well, interesting, you in. another interesting thing, though, Kev, is the fact that once again, uh, somebody saw Bigfoot on all fours and stood up to two oh, feet. Yeah. So that's a relatively commonplace thing, seeing this thing w w crouching down like a quadruped and having the ability. The best story was uh, along came a spider. <laughs> uh, and we'll, we'll do that again one of these days when those hog hunters yeah. saw that thing crawling along in the grass and then it jumped to its feet. Yeah. Uh, so, and in fact, Philip. In volume 10, my buddy Philip, uh, when he first saw his Bigfoot, it was on all fours. And he thought, what else could it be but a bear? Yeah. Uh, but lo and behold, <laughs> the tide would be turned uh, a short while later, you know, when it revealed what it really was. Oh, you yeah, know? no doubt about it. So uh, interesting, really, really interesting, you know, account. And from Pennsylvania. So, you know, folks, when you think uh, everything in the world of Bigfoot is relegated to, uh, you know, Oregon and, uh, you know, Washington State, Northern California, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> you know, no, there is stuff going on all over the place uh, with these creatures. No, Pennsylvania is a bit of a hotbed, for sure. Yeah. And it's pretty rural. You know, it's hard. Like I sit here in North Carolina and I think... Well, Pennsylvania is not that rural, but if you're out there driving in your car, it's pretty rural. Yeah. Kind of like when I drove up through Whitehall, New York, Bill. Yeah, yeah. And I told you I was skeptical at first, and then when I was there driving in the car for like three hours up towards Lake Champlain, I was like, I didn't see another car. Yeah, and you're saying, did I already drive through Whitehall? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Was that Whitehall, that house? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, we lose track quickly yeah. of the amount of uninhabited real estate in North America. And I folks, I reiterate again, nine and a half million square miles. We'll try to wrap your head around that figure. That's a lot of uh woods, a lot of water. A lot of places to hide, a lot of mountains, a lot of everything. Yep. And a lot of animals. Whew. Wow, man. Very cool. So, bro, what do we have 
in a listener mail this week. Oh, Friday. we got some good listener mail this week. Um, so first one comes in from Teresa, and she says, I heard WJ on Coast to Coast with Richard Serrett a few weeks ago and decided to buy two copies of his most recent book and give as birthday gifts after I read one of them myself, of course. <laughs> I hope you I, didn't dog ear the pages. No, don't, be, don't highlight anything in there. You'll give yourself away. And But uh, Teresa writes, I thought WJ did a fantastic interview with Richard. Well-spoken and so interesting. Bill, do you think she was listening to you? Absolutely. Who else could she be listening to? <laughs> After reading the book, I decided to download a few of your most recent podcasts to see what those were like. What a beautiful surprise to hear not only WJ, but his brother, too. I adore the way you converse with one another, and WJ's laugh is more infectious than COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I think she means that in a good way. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I, she says, I'm an avid dog walker and walk five to seven miles a day, so truly enough to laugh out loud at banter to keep me company as I walk dogs. I quite literally laugh as I'm walking and really have fun <laughs> listening to you both. Thank you for the gathering of cryptid stories and sharing them in such an entertaining way. I'm now a devoted fan, Teresa. Well, that's great, Teresa. Thank you so much. Yeah, awesome. And by the way, folks, if you're new to the show, this is our typical format. Uh, we get into a little strange and unusual uh, at the beginning, and then we turn the page into some Bigfoot-related activities. And sometimes the beginning of the show can also be Bigfoot-related. That's and right. then we uh, open up some of our listener mail to our other listeners. Yeah. So really cool to hear from Teresa. Very cool. Yeah. So our next email comes in from Joe. And Joe's subject is weird happenings after my dad passed away. Hmm. He said, oh, hello, just discovered your podcast. Good stuff. I've had a few strange things happening since my dad passed. Uh, they've ceased. They've, they've seemed to be nothing scary, but definitely proves people can communicate after they've left this place we call home. Mm -hmm. I'm a Christian, although he was not religious. Would love to share about some of these several stories. We'll continue to listen also going to check out the books. These are for sure strange, right up your guy's alley. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. You know, I think I reached out to Joe and I haven't heard back from him. So, Joe, if you're listening, uh, check your email or get back to me. I'd like to have a conversation with you. So, yeah, it's not too scary, uh, with the exception of the 13-inch long butcher knife that flew across the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, Joe. <laughs> Although, Kev, you know, my friend Tom, uh, who just did the uh, steps on my house a few months ago, uh, Tom had his grandparents, and they're still there. Uh, they lived upstate New York. Uh, they have a big old mansion that was built by, I think Tom said, like a riverboat captain. Okay. So somebody that was involved in uh, uh, steamship or ship commerce, uh, maybe coming down from the Great Lakes into New York. The guy was well to do. This is a nice, nice old house. Yep. And Tom had told me one day, and we were talking about it months ago, about uh, poltergeist activity in the house and in the home on the adjoining property. So, uh, you know, strange things go on out there, you know. And again, when it happens to you, uh, the tide turns, so to speak. No doubt about it. You know. So, uh, yeah, that's a, good, that's a good piece of mail there by Joe. Very cool. All right. All right. The next one comes in from Mike, and it's about Wyoming, east of Hoback Junction, Junction, in the winter of 09 slash 10. And uh, Mike writes, Hello, this is a short Cliff's Notes version. I was traveling east towards Pinedale 
and a cross rim divide. Oh, it was January 2010, about 10 p.m. I was traveling slow due to the winter conditions and the possibility of animals stepping onto the roadway from the timber. I saw what I first thought was a man, a snowmobiler, step onto the road from the south crossing. But he was tall and didn't acknowledge me at all. Mm. His arms were long, had a very long stride, otherwise didn't seem disproportionate for his height. Mm. I hate to guess at the height, but he was taller than any college basketball player I ever saw. Mm -hmm. I slowed down to a crawl, but I did not stop. Hair on the back of my neck sort of a thing. I never went snowmobiling in that area again. Mm. Again, it was night. Timber on my right and some blowing snow. Regards, Mike. Uh, what do you make of that, Kev? Well, I mean, who the heck would be out in Wyoming roaming around crossing the street on foot by themselves? Yeah, and, you know, I'm big on uh, people acknowledging another human. So uh, a telltale in that is that, you know, whether he waved or just the fact yeah. that you run into somebody in those circumstances and that, at the very least, give them a high sign, like, you know, hey, you know. Yeah, even if you don't look at them. Yeah, just a little just wave. Just your hand up in the Something, air. Yeah. you know, it just seems normal. No, that's a good point, Bill. You know. And, Something uh, to show it's a bit normal. You know, it could have been one of the Brooklyn Nets annoyed with his game and just went out there to get lost for a while. Out to Wyoming, Bill? Yeah, just walk around in a blizzard to forget Take about it. Take their private jet up there and yeah, to sit down in a field and go yeah, for a to walk. Forget about the bulls whooping your butt in the garden or in the <laughs> Brook, Brookhaven Barclays Center. <laughs> uh, well, Bill, our last email that we'll go through tonight is one of my favorites of all time. Uh-huh. Comes in from Lori from Maryland. <laughs> she says, hi, Bill and KJ. I listen to lots of podcasts, uh -huh. and you two are still my favorite. I was so excited to hear that Bill visited the fourth graders on Zoom. That had to have been those kids' favorite day of school ever. <laughs> uh, she yeah. says, I teach kindergarten. And I think some of your stories would give my kinders nightmares. <laughs> it's too bad because I'd love to see what pictures of Bigfoot they come up with. And I'd love to have them talk with Bill. Yeah. It would be my favorite day of teaching. Keep the stories coming. All the best, Lori from Maryland. So, you know, all I want to say, Lori, is what makes you think the fourth graders didn't have nightmares? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can't deny a kid in the garden or his just due. I mean, you know, come on. Yeah, make the arrangement, Lori. I'll be there. Yeah, and I'll show up with my Krampus suit on. <laughs> I'll greet the kids after uh, Bill does the stories, just yeah. in case they're not terrified enough. Yeah, and I'll bring along my stuffed Alux doll. I'll bring a little backpack in case any of them don't behave during the uh, reading, and I'll stuff them in there like a Krampus would. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, no, we love the little chillin'. No, no youngins were harmed in this broadcast. <laughs> but great stuff, uh, Bill. Good podcast this week, folks. I apologize for my voice. I'm going to be laid back, not doing so much international travel, at least over the next month or so. So hopefully my voice will come back. But thank you so much for the great reviews. Keep those five-star reviews coming. And if you want to write a little review to go along with the five stars, that's great. But if you haven't given us a five-star review lately, or if you've never given us one, right now, get on your favorite podcast player. Give us five stars because it's just about the only way we have of attracting new listeners. Yeah, good stuff, Kev. And remember, folks, if you've seen something, say something. You could reach out to us at BigfootTerrorInTheWoods.com. Hit the contact button. Uh, tell me what your experience was, and uh, I will certainly reach out to you. And by the way, folks, if you should find yourself 
working out in a farm. See something a little unusual. You better remember one thing. Always carry more gun than you think you're gonna need. Sleep tight. <laughs>